session. Once again, my name is Bakisha Parker Edgecombe, and I will serve as your facilitator for this session. Thank you so much for returning. Minister Kwesi Thompson, fellow colleagues, Mr. Ian Roll of the Grand Bahama Port Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Good afternoon. We're going to get started. I know all of you would have been here this morning, and you would have been enticed with exactly how we are going to turn Grand Bahama into a tech hub, and I'm happy that you have returned to get even more information. Our session today, in this session, will deal exclusively with how we can create a competitive edge. How will we be able to compete a competitive edge, or rather create? With that being said, I will introduce my platform guest, at which time I will ask each of you to come up and give us your presentation, just about a minute or two, on how we can do that, followed by questions that will be posed to you and moving forward. Is that good for you? All righty. Please welcome, as a part of our panel, Diedrich Adderley of Quantum Data Solutions. Diedrich. Who will come and give us a two-minute presentation on how we can create a competitive advantage. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. All right, Excellent. he can sit and speak. Go right ahead. So my name is Diedrich Adderley. I am native to Grand Bahama. I, I, I went to St. Paul's. Grew up here. <laughs> and as a local Bahamian entrepreneur, I've under, I understand our environment. I understand our requirements. And um, I think I'm in a position to say that um, our greatest asset that we have, our competitive edge that we have here um, in Grand Bahama is our human capital. We have a lot of local talent. And um, if given the opportunity, I think if we polish them up, help them out as much as possible, we can create several, several opportunities for, for companies here to, to utilize a lot of our local talent. I look forward to hearing more from you. Welcome also, Mr. James Clark of Global Sun Integration Management. Mr. Clark. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Clark, uh, CEO and founder of Global Sun Integration Management. Um, I'm Bohemian. Uh, live and reside <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's important. Uh, live in Nassau. I uh, actually do a lot of business and consulting in Freeport. Uh, and um, like um, Mr. Andy said, we actually done some projects together. I think um, and one of the key things in also creating a competitive advantage in, for the tech hub would be actually creating um, what you would call a hybrid scholastic approach with University of Bahamas allowing technical vocational schools like that of DeVry with BTVI where you actually garnish the skills and help the, what we would call the human capital to actually develop into providing the talent for the technology hub. I think this is key because at the end of the day, I know I went to school, I got a four year degree, but I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I did Cal 2 and I can't tell you up to date what, what I ever used Cal 2 yet. <laughs> so I mean, the, the elective uh, subjects are key, but you have some key persons that they want to focus on a technical area where they actually could be benefit to actually A, either become a technical specialist in a particular area or become an expert and open up their own business. Thank you very much. Please welcome Mr. Bahamas Digital Solutions himself, C. Allen Johnson. Thank you, thank you. I think our greatest competitive uh, advantage is location, location, location. I know we are here uh, concerning, first let me just introduce myself. I am C. Allen Johnson. I have been involved with computers for a little over 35 years. I'm from the era of the punch cards. Uh, going in the pre-80s, I had the opportunity to work at IBM at the time when they were developing the IBM PC, IBM PC Junior, and the laptop. I've had opportunity to work with some of the giants in the industry. I've worked for companies that no longer exist, such as Burroughs and other different individuals that I've had as consultancy over the last 35 years. Technology is all I know. I live, breathe, dream it. Uh, the, the competitive advantage we have is location, location, absolutely location. 
And the point is that we are here in a discussion for a technology hub. And I don't want to broaden the conversation, but I see Freeport or Grand Bahama as a whole as a gateway to the, to the technology hub known as the Bahamas. I think that we have the uh, absolute potential for, uh, based on our constitutional structure, where we guarantee privacy, where we are moving now into an era of uh, away from secrecy and, low ta and no taxes, where we can bring in legislation to afford us the opportunity to be low tax, to make those attractive to the, uh, those digital companies. We also have the, the, the protection of privacy, where we become a, a privacy, low tax environment, where we can become the, a, the hub for database uh, management and information. We can become the home to fintech, reg techs, educational technology. You know, we have thousands of individuals every year that's denied access to the United States where we can make this a, 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 an environment for where those students attend a digital environment where we have MOOC, the type of environment for education online that we can actually have here. What we have is we have the opportunity where we say Donald Trump is giving, doing us a big favor. Those thousands of individuals where we have an aggressive immigration reform policy for protection of citizenship for behemoths, that we can begin to create those type of digital workspaces because we have the infrastructure and where Donald Trump don't want them into America, we have the digital <coughs> infrastructure that allow those, those, those companies to be located here and give access to their service. I mean, mm -hmm. we have the opportunity that I put to you that we uh, could absolutely transform the Caribbean and actually the world. And I do believe that uh, locally as well as internationally, we possess the digital capital. I know from growing up, the number, being in the U.S., the number of behemoths that are just looking for the opportunity to come home. And mm -hmm. with all due respect, they're not looking for jobs. They're looking for an opportunity to be integrated into a system that allows for themselves to be self-empowered. Empower, and let me say, Hawksville High. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Close it out like that, right? <laughs> Please put your hands together for Mr. Damaris Cash of Network Security. Good afternoon. Um, the, my company's name is uh, Network and Security Consulting Group. Uh, my name is Demarius Cash. Just to give you a brief history, um, I left the Bahamas on a track scholarship, ran Division One track, um, trained with a lot of people in this room like uh, Troy, McIntosh, and I am Mr. Lewis. So we didn't know each other on the track, on the track level. But then um, in terms of my path, I was a math major. And you know, called back home, my sister said, hey, my thing can take you nowhere in the world. So I said, let me, let me do computer engineering. So I did computer engineering, got my degree and everything, and what, what, what happened, I was uh, on job at um, Atlantis and was um, always wanted more, and did a lot of big projects, Miss Universe, um, did IT work for that, and all, all kind of big projects, but I want, always wanted more. So I stepped out and formed Network and Security Consulting Group. And where I, where I see Freeport, Grand Mahama, um, the competitive edge. If you look at Silicon Valley, um, one thing that, that it's around, it's, it's uh, University of Stanford. And I think right here we have UB. And UB is a good model where we could start research and development. And if you look at research and development, you look at everyone is doing it now. The U.S. is big on that. And we know our, our um, Eastern partners, um, China is big on research and development. And first, we can look at needs assessments and then run into research and development. So that's critical when you're looking at anything you're dealing with technology because we got we to gotta push that type of skill set out in this community and this economy. Thank you very much. Of Convergence, please welcome to the stage Kimberly King Burns. Yes. No. no. Can you? Testing one, two, three. Testing, testing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I completely agree with what C. Allen said. And I, I call you C. Allen because yes. we're Facebook friends. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, this is how we stay in touch. Um, the, the opportunity is for Grand Bahama to set the stage for creating an entire archipelago. I mean, we are unique as a small island nation in being able to showcase and support a variety of technologies. And unlike Bangalore and Kuala Lumpur and Mexico, I don't think we need to necessarily be the low-cost uh, technology health um, sector. I think we have a real opportunity to become the Saudi Arabia of the Caribbean 
with regard to alternative energy, clean technology, air to water condensation. Water is going to become as important as fuel in the next 10 years, and we are physically, geographically, and financially um, located to take perfect advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that I don't hear much, I haven't heard much in the way of this conversation over the last five years, but you do have investors that want to create jobs, and they want to make investments to secure visas. Mm -hmm. So while we are talking about developing um, an easier protocol to import skilled workers, I would like to suggest that we consider embracing the EB-5 um, uh, style program that's available across North America, wherein in the US, uh, uh, an, an immigrant would pay $500,000 and hope to invest in a company that created 10 jobs over a two-year period. In Canada, the same program is a 700,000 moon investment. Mm -hmm. uh, th there are programs like this around the world. This isn't unique. Um, I think Australia's is probably the most expensive because it's 7 million US. For a single visa, uh, you do have to have the job creation in part. But I think that there's a real opportunity to introduce a similar program here because there are wealthy entrepreneurs as well. We mm -hmm. don't have to be hat in hand. We've got the human capital. We've got the entrepreneurial drive. I mean, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. I trained kids that were fixing CPUs with butter knives. We are nothing if not inventive and creative, and we're friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've been told that Dr. Gadrin Higgs is currently live on a television show, and he will be joining us shortly. And we'll welcome him at that time, and the moment will continue. And this question then is for this session, obviously, creating a competitive edge. Let's begin by establishing what are we doing wrong right now that isn't resulting in us taking advantage of technology the way it ought to be taken advantage of. I'll pose this question to um, C. Allen Johnson as well as Ms. Kim, um, if you will kindly um, inform us as to what are we doing wrong right now that's not getting us to the point where we can take advantage of technology. After you, sir. Okay. I think what we're doing wrong is we're looking to the governmental structures to do what is necessary for the development of an industry that requires the collective intelligence of literally hundreds if not thousands of individuals. I think what we have to do is we need government to recognize we need basically two things from them. We need legislation that, that is necessary for whatever it is that we are seeking to do. We need a, a, a strategy that is collectively harnessed from us as a, as, as a group that forms a strategy by which we can each develop our own individual plans. We need the laws that is, that is there, and we need the shifting of policies. But we don't need government to drive industry. Uh, because what happens is when you begin to limit yourself to the intellectual capital of what we have, what we call the House of Assembly or even those appointed, you're talking about less than maybe 250 individuals in a country of 250,000 innovative creative thinkers. If you look at our population demographics, you would find that as much as 60% of them are born into a whole digital era. They are digital citizens. Those of us that is pre-1992, um, most of us have what is called, you could say maybe a a nationalization card uh, for the digital citizenry, those are born digital. We, we are naturalized and then some are uh, walking around illegal in the digital world. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you were to ask young people and you challenge them to simply say, we're, and, and this is where the, collect, the human capital comes in, and you know, we talk about our education system, and I, I challenge any of you as far as the education system is, take an English speaking child and teach that child in Swahili. And then when the child fails, you say that he couldn't learn. We haven't embraced the language that they, that they speak. And so what we need is we need government to recognize that we ask them to govern and not manage us. And so if you just create that, that perfect harmony. And so it isn't where we are trying to uh, de uh, dismantle government. I am a strong advocate for a strong municipal type type governance. Mm -hmm. And I think Grand Bahama provides that unique detail for even if it doesn't transition to it in the immediate, it allows for us to have an actual conversation concerning transformation of how we think, how mm -hmm. we are governed, 
and how we are in the global marketplace. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. Just one point. I am what they call, uh, uh, I, 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 I live in what most people call a metaverse. Mm -hmm. That's where most people live in multiple places in the future. And so I understand, and, it's a, and I talk to young people all the time, they live in these metaverses, and it's, it's an idea for where they live and where they exist, where they want us to move to, but we don't give them the opportunity to describe or express it. And so what we simply say, this is what you're going to have. And so what we want is less governance and more development. Thank you very much. Ms. Burns? What are we doing wrong? I, th I think, you know, you do have some unique opportunities here because in many ways we are a number of countries within one country. And yes, the Nassau-centric approach is to expect government to lead the way and then the private sector will follow. Um, the out islands have largely been ignored. And as a result, I think uh, we've built a certain resilience and savvy based on need. And Grand Bahama is unique in that it straddles both of those cultures, but you have a sense of history here that gets transferred. My, my biggest frustration, because I've been consulting with the Bahamas government since I was 16, and my first project was with the Ministry of Youth and Sports probably in the 1980s. There isn't a transfer of knowledge from one administration to the next. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly having to push the same rock up the same hill, and then you bait and switch, and the administration changes, which is why I'm resolutely apolitical. But as our new Minister of Parliament for North Eleuthera, mm -hmm. who is our first Rylander ever, I knew we had a Lutheran in there, but <laughs> as Ricky Mackey has said, what we would like Nassau to do is to give us permission, mm -hmm. not stand in our way. Just let us go, let us produce, because we've shown that we can stick microwaves in palm trees mm -hmm. to build Wi-Fi networks that Cable Bahamas and Batelco didn't really thought needed to be built south of Rock Sound. Understood. You want to add to that? Go right ahead. Um, I think another thing here, too, we have to bring some, some facts, some data into it. If you look at uh, reports that have been surfacing, I think over the last year, the Bahamas, we rank 120 something in ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at, if the government, if we're capturing this data, how, how are we making it better? Mm -hmm. There's no, we have to try to find solutions to get in that, in that top 30. Mm -hmm. So person could come here and invest and, 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 and open up businesses and stuff like that. Because if you look at the top five, you have uh, New Zealand is number one and the U.S. is number five. Mm -hmm. So I think the ease of business Opening stuff, uh, going through the whole process, we need to look at that, that, that data and see how best we could, we could uh, get in the top 30. Right. How do we begin that? How do we begin that, um, Clark? Um, if I can jump in here. Not a problem. I, um, just, just a micro bit. I hmm. think that um, we tend to have uh, administrators dictate to technicians and information officers on how to how to implement certain technology and how to move things forward in the technological aspect of their business operations. I think what would help is if we actually have um, engineers or specialists steer uh, the direction of, of mm -hmm. where we should be going. Right? Will that create the competitive edge though? I, it, it, it most definitely will because we are trained um, to study business analytics. I walk into an environment and um, a client starts to tell me about what their challenges are. Right. I turn that into bits and bytes and then give it back to you and say, this is where we need to go. Clark, are we afraid of going there? Is this something that we're just not used to? And because it has changed, we're now afraid to even remotely start it as we should? Are we afraid to go there? Well, what you're really talking about is now is actually a culture shift. Okay. Um, because the way we do business now is so much different from what it was back then. Even from when I remember first going to college, I mean, you know, Windows 95 was the latest thing. Now these kids being born with, two, I know, Windows 2010. So, I mean, it's like right now it's like the market is prime. But I think um, to the point is the governance hasn't changed. So we're still trying to govern society with a 1960, 1970 mm -hmm. philosophy. Yeah, we're we'll practicing. We're now in 2017. Okay. Dr. Higgs, we're here and we're in Grand Bahama and we're hoping to basically um, kind of label Grand Bahama as that tech hub. 
What about the landscape and the infrastructure will result in that? Is what's happening on the ground, whether it's industrialization and other businesses popping up, really instrumental or will be instrumental in ensuring that this happens for this island? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I feel as though that there, it has to come from within the individual to be able to want to see that change. Now, the thing is, there needs to be multiple individuals that want to be a part of this change. So as we talk about um, on the policy side, as we talk about on the, on the, the entrepreneurship side, um, all of these in different individuals sort of need to come to the table to be able to talk about how is it that we can pull everything together to make it a thriving um, part of, of our economy. Right. Does it begin? Go right ahead. The, the point I want to make is that I think you hit on a point that in the 21st century, as we move, and a lot of us talk about this knowledge-based economy, we are moving to, quickly towards what is called, you know, we have, it, it is a digital economy, but it's not the digital economy. Mm -hmm. In about 2020, we'll be moving towards that. Data, big data, dark data, which is like how you say you could see the seen world and unseen world, is one of the most valuable currencies there is. And believe it or not, the intellectual capital we possess is part of that dark data. But the, 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 the problem that we're having is that there is no outlet. We should have, like we talk about Grand Bahama being the, 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 the location, location, location. We have a unique opportunity to have a wider conversation where we move away from the model of governance. And the beauty about digitalization is that one doesn't replace one in the immediate. They can actually be a two-tiered type environment mm -hmm. for those who is afraid to embrace the future we can go and prepare the future for you, and when you get there, it'll be one you expect. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> Does the competitive edge begin with our youth? And I'm not talking about high school. Does it begin at the preschool level? And how can we implement it at that level without necessarily um, kind of causing their minds to just you know, go beyond their years. How can we do it? Right ahead, Ms. Burns. I would recommend that you not limit your focus to educating children. Mm. Uh, when IBM Nassau first teamed with us in 1999 and we were going around the out islands training people who wanted to use computers, they wanted to get online and operational, government workers lined up, hotel workers lined up, adult entrepreneurs lined up, kids lined up. Got it. There are a lot of people that don't necessarily have the skill set that have a, a really savvy solution. And I think that you're going to find that uh, from straw workers to PhDs. Mm -hmm. So I, I would recommend, I mean, given that older Bahamians have a sense of history that the younger kids don't. We were talking about this this morning. The, the textbooks I grew up with were Macmillan Caribbean and specific to the region. Mm -hmm. The textbooks that you see coming out of NASA are 15 years old and they were published in Ohio, you know? Mm -hmm. There's no relevance. People aren't, the people today under the age of 30 don't understand the importance of the suffragettes. They couldn't tell you Dame Doris Johnson from Lady Marguerite. They just don't have a sense of how powerful on the world stage the Bahamas was in 1967 mm -hmm. when majority rule took place and we went from minority rule of a majority population to the conceived majority rule without a shot being fired. That had never been done in the history of the world. Those are the kind of proud moments that we should be celebrating. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to need our older generation to be part of this digital media revolution because the information is not on the ground at the moment. Right. Thank you. You wanted to add to that, Andrea? I see you. The competitive edge. I think, I think also the way to elevate that, um, that, that the topic is to also change the way that we, we deliver our, our content to our students. Mm -hmm. So if we if we tell them that the way for you to re, uh, to receive this your 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 uh, your course line is via a tablet and you have to go online and you have to pull down your email and see exactly what your deliverables are for homework. Um, I think it, it elevates the it, it elevates the citizenry across the board. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Go right ahead. What we have to do is we have to recognize what the United Nations has recognized, that broadband is a human right. Mm. And we are in the 21st century. It is not an option anymore, especially in the next three years. If you go and you look at Saudi Arabia and the other places where we're going, 
they are, they are describing the future. What we have to do is we have to unleash the potential of our children by allowing them to have what is called an immersive type environment of learning. Because what we have is, and I think one of you kind of led to it, is what we have is the 20th century leaders using 19th century concepts trying to govern a 21st century country. And so what we have to do is we have to basically, I, I think for those of us as older that understand the concept that hindsight is 2020. If hindsight is 2020, let's stop existing in the, in the present and start in the future where we want to be and plot a part back to where we are. And that's the easiest way of doing it as opposed to moving through the maze. The expression is when you look from the top of the maze, you see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Those in the maze only see the part they're walking. So what we do have to do is elevate our thinking above the maze and let's describe the Bahamas we want in 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever amount of years and begin to use the collective intelligence of all of us to basically harness that power to simply what is the part that we will take looking back, standing in the future, looking back to where we are, and how do we get there? Thank you. Cash Clark, were both of you always on this path where you're now um, at with technology, or was there a shift at some time, and when did that happen for you? And why did it happen, you feel? Well, GM stands with <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you move at the time, so? Um, honestly, I would say, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. my... My degree was in computer information systems, worked in North Carolina for a while, um, started off as an application developer, went and started doing, uh, working for the networking team. Back then, we were doing like switching out token ring networks to Ethernet, um, worked at NASDAQ project as an engineer um, wow. for you, um, MCI WorldCom at the time, and came home. Actually, yeah, well, I did divert one part, and that was that entrepreneurial spirit. I came home, started a engraving metal type business, was very successful, so let off. Got kind of bored, went back into technology again, um, and worked at, well, that time COB, worked there for a few years, and then went, went to the offshore bank. But for most part, I always was in technology and always tried to stay at cutting edge, even any new business initiatives that I did, always tried to do my research to stay at the cutting edge. Right. Cash, are you, are you happy to be a part of this industry? Is it worth it? Yeah, it's, it's worth it, um, and, and I just want to let the young speak to the young people because everyone they look at the the, the after story, mm -hmm. you know they don't follow it from the beginning. Uh, with, <laughs> with me, I started I got a whole different business model in terms of trying to compete with custom computers, uh, Micronet, and all those guys selling PCs and all this. And then it wasn't it wasn't me. I took all my savings and say, hey, let me buy all these machines, hope that people could buy it. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work out. But what happened is I had to change on the go. And that's the thing you've got to realize with business. Mm -hmm. You have to be creative in thinking. You, can't, um, you have to be able to adapt. Be adapt. That's, why, that's why I always recommend that whole research and development and, and, and the needs, what the, what the economy needs, mm -hmm. what, what it needs right now. And just, just in terms of um, technology, yeah, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it and, and science and technology because I always look at a downfall as an opportunity. Right, right. Dr. Higgs, you're a part of Silicon Valley? Yeah. Okay. What you see there, can you envision that being here in Grand Bahama? And what advice would you give us in being on that competitive edge? Where will we begin? With this similar form such as this always? Or is there another avenue that we can take? Yeah, so I feel like a, a summit like this is a great start for getting on that path and, and continuing that. Um, coming out of the summit, there would need to be continuous discussions about how do we turn some of the ideas that we've discussed here into reality? How do we actually make it um, something that's tangible whereby we're attracting and, and we're having individuals who, who are developing their own business ideas here within Grand Bahama and within the Bahamas? So I think it's a fabulous start for, for us to be having this, this conference and this summit. And I think it's just the beginning of what we need to continue to do. What so, is, go ahead. Yeah, there, there are two things that I, that I want to add. Uh, the first of which well, we talked about before um, would have been a little bit about uh, taking risks, right? So we talked about technology. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I wasn't always in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left my graduate program, I, I went on to consult. Mm -hmm. And so through consulting, I remember having the conversations when I was leaving Stanford. Folks were like, why are you going into consulting? You know, PhD folks, they, they, they should be professors. 
And I thought, well, that's, that might be the stereotype, but I'm interested in, in, in learning more about business. And so for me, it was that element of taking risks, right? Whereby I got the opportunity to learn more and more about what it's like to be in a business environment. And it's benefit, benefited me tremendously when I went back into technology because I now had the business skill sets that has allowed me to contribute even more. Uh, so, so that's the first thing I want to point out. And then the second thing, we talked a little bit about, about education. Right? Um, think about it. The kids who are in school today, they're going to be retiring basically 40, 50 years from now. What can we possibly tell them about what the world is going to look like in 50 years <laughs> from now if we don't even know what the world is going to look like in 10 years, in five years? Right? So the way that I like to think about it, and I've, I've been having this conversation on and on, with, particularly with my, my brothers, which is we need to learn how to learn and be good at it. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to be resilient. We need to be able to be adaptive, as was mentioned. And we need to be able to seize the opportunities when they come. Gone are the days when you would go to school, you learn just a very niche trade, and then that's what you do for the rest of your life. We're, we're in a world where it's very fast-paced. It's, it's moving, it's evolving, and those who don't adapt the technology will be left behind. So, uh, again, I, I want to encourage, I see the youth, a few of you are still here, but I want to encourage them you know, to adopt the mindset of, of learning how to learn and, and be good at it, because that's the, the skill that's going to take you throughout life and help you to be successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And the importance of ICTs, yeah, just what happens is he makes a point because mm -hmm. the typical person in this new digital dispensation stays at a job only on average of five years. And so when you go to school for any particular thing, if you don't learn how to learn, you will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is we have to begin to create an environment. And we talked about the, 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 the power of, of, of location or the competitive advantage. One of the things that we have is that we have a, an excellent relationship with our neighbors to the north. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the geopolitical aspect of who we are. We also have the digital infrastructure that runs through us. We have the intellectual capital. And now what we have to do is we have to teach our children to think. We have to begin to tell them that it's impossible to see something that don't exist. So if they can see it in their mind, we must provide a means for them to move towards it. And so they can recognize what OPM, OPE, and OPI is. Other people efforts, other people money, and other people ideas. And that's what innovation is. <laughs> it's basically being able to manage and improving upon that. And so if we begin to just say, provide the environment where we not direct them into tourism, banking, or whatever, and we can actually, and we use an example, we want to develop the Bahamas. And we say, we don't have the money for consultants. Why don't we just have a prize, find a million dollars, and then have a competitive thing where mm -hmm. Uh, engineering companies or whatever around the world would submit their plans and mm -hmm. all of their plans become our part of our intellectual capital as part of the comp competition. Tell us what it is to be a green island. Tell us what it is to be a digital island. Tell us what it is to transform education. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we, we, we put that date there and we could get millions of right. dollars of technological ideas as to what it is. Because these companies want to be that one company and to basically say they did the Bahamas. And we can become that digital community, that digital city, that digital island, and that digital country. I was just about to ask the question. Very good, very good. Has the time come for us, and all of you can answer this, for us to redirect our efforts? You know, right now we maintain that tourism is our number one industry. Um, we invest much into that area. Has the time come for a shift in focus with regards to our industries. Shift a paradigm. With regard and, and maintaining or, or creating this competitive advantage in this area. Uh, well, Beginning with you, okay. I would like an answer from all of you okay. on that. Okay, here's the point. <laughs> Tourism is not gonna go away. Banking is not gonna go away. Financial services are not gonna go away. The problem is their transition to digital. It's gonna become FinTech. It is gonna become more one of a immersion tourism where you have culture where people come to experience you more than their location. So we should be able to say, okay, come experience the culture of the Bahamas, sun, sand, sea, and technology. And so what happens is that, that culture, so we have to say, okay, what is banking moving to? Digitalization, FinTech. What is, what is a, a, a financial service, I mean, they moving to? I think someone mentioned the whole concept of, of a repository where we become the database of the entire world. Data 
is the new currency of the 21st century. And so what we have to do is, we don't have to abandon them, we need to rethink them from a 21st century type environment mm -hmm. and become that place where, let me understand this, where we have the, they say we, we, we suffer from de-risking. Why don't we just create a database, uh, I think uh, Mr. Moxie touched on this, we create a database where all of those re repositories are put here. We don't have to even share the information with us, you know. But if the United States come to us and say, you approve this person, we say that's because you didn't put it in the database. UK, you didn't put it in the database. Yeah. And so we become that, that point of exchange. And so what we have to do is just imagine the possible. The Bahamas is IMP, where we say the impossible becomes, uh, where, where imagination becomes uh, possible and it becomes a reality through the mm -hmm. collaborative efforts. Thank office. you very much. I'll go to the end, Ms. Burns. As the lone liberal arts major on the stage, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think we want to scare everybody into thinking that they have to become an, elect an electric uh, engineer or yeah. kind of computer science. It's a phenomenal skill set to have. But I think, to Dr. Higgs's point, the ability to learn and assess and revive and recycle and pivot is a skill set in and of itself. I'm an English major. I mm -hmm. told stories for the <laughs> six years on a PBS station in Florida. And I was fascinated by technology because where I grew up, you know, power would go out for 11 weeks at a time. And oh we got God. really good at, you know, generators and VHF radios and CD sets. So I was always about finding tools for communication. Our culture, as a Bahamian culture, is sun, sea, sand, but it's so much more. Okay. We are Gullah. We are a Lutheran adventurers. We've got Red Bay Andrus that nobody seems to know about. Mm. We have got a completely different mm. dialect and Ragged Island to explore. And I'm working with a group out of uh, Discovery Channel right now that is working to cite a, a three-year exploration here, three-year three season, studying shipwrecks that Gordon Cooper, the astronaut, saw from space during you know, the 1980s. These waters were that vivid. We've got oceanographers that fight to study here. There are so many ways to deploy technology to help us tell our unique stories. Absolutely. The Gullah Sea Island Coalition, you know, the islands off of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, we have so much in common with them. And obviously, it's not color specific. Right. It's about telling the stories. It's about not suggesting that our Bahamian dialect is less than. Yes. I, I supported Ebonics only because my Jamaican teachers on Harbor Island in the 60s mm -hmm. taught us in Patois, and they taught us in standard English, which is what well, I can only speak at home. <laughs> but it was so that we could continue to communicate with the elders. Absolutely. And I think if we make this more holistic, um, that in and of itself is going to be one of our unique positions. We've got the glorious environment. We've got really smart, creative, classic people. But we have got stories on stories that we still haven't begun to tell. Thank you very much. Kat. Yeah. Um, I think there should, should be a shift because um, I think it should provide the opportunity for those young people in the back there because my, my daughter, she's now at um, Arizona State. She went to Queens College, mm -hmm. and even though I'm a soccer, but she went to Queens I, I, College. San Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> she went to she went to Queen's College and she's having a warm time. I like to say warm time dealing with, she's in uh, biomedical engineering. So that's, that's, that's given her a whole different outlook or onset mm -hmm. in, in life because we didn't provide the opportunity for her to venture into engineering from a young age. And the kids in the U.S., you know, they're on a different level where they do that engineering from, from early onset. Absolutely. So, so I, think, I think we just need to provide the opportunity. We are, look at our education system. We don't start from young. Mm -hmm. We start from... Um, um, five, six, and go straight up. <laughs> Not too young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But the thing is... Not from three months old. That's okay. Three months yeah. old. Grade five, six. And, and just give them a chance to be um, a play in it. Because, and then, you know, technology, when you look at GDP, and in terms of um, providing a, a, a sustainable job, yeah. it's, it's, the way, it's the way to go. All right. Higgs, doctor? Sure. Uh, so, tourism has been good for the economy in a lot of ways, and it's, it's still a strong pillar of the economy. Uh, so, I don't want everyone to get up and run out of the room and say, we're done with tourism. Uh, 
Um, it's, it's still going to be around, but things are going to change a little bit, mm-hmm. or things will have to change in a little bit. When I think about technology, really, you fall into one of two camps. Mm-hmm. Either you embrace it, you love it, you run forward with it, or you get left behind. There's, there's no one that's stuck in the middle. You, either you, you, you sort of take a little bit of time to understand it. And, and it doesn't have to be very difficult. And what I mean by that is, even at a, at a small fundamental level, being willing to embrace it and learn about it and engage with it, as opposed to the, I don't know it, therefore I'm not going to touch it mindset, mm-hmm. right? So being able to, to have that willingness to try and willingness to embrace it, and for those who actually you know, pick it up and really run with it and do well, that creates more and more opportunity. But in general, as a culture, there has to be the willingness to adopt it. All right. Clark? Yeah, I definitely think... Um Tourism has sustained this for a very long time. The reality is it has to be a paradigm shift because, I mean, realistically, we say sun, sun, and sea. I mean, even though I think, you know, Exoma, where I'm from, has the most beautiful beaches in the world. <laughs> but now in this, this economy, everybody has sun, sun, and sea. So I think what we've, we've went away from, and I think in Michael Johnson's uh, presentation, when he talked about the fine experience at a stadium, that's where we're missing even in tourism for a while, because persons are not going to come and take their hard-earned money if they're not going to have a good experience. Mm-hmm. If we develop this technology help, persons coming here, like Mr. Cash said earlier, to come do business, the ease of business has to be good. They have to have a good experience. Mm-hmm. When I come and set up my technology company here in Freeport, I have to have a good experience. Mm-hmm. So we need to get better as a culture selling good experiences. Mm-hmm. Well, Adelaide? Uh, during our earlier uh, conversations, we, we heard about smart city. And at the core of it, smart city is essentially taking dumb things and having us, giving us interaction, Mm. um, transitive communication with it. And um, what it clearly states is that technology has inserted itself into everything. It's in radio, it's in television, it's in all that we do. We hear about um, now LTE technology. Um, We we have to embrace it, harness it, and see how we can get it to drive drive it forward and see how we can move as a country. All right, as the lady of the hour. Well, on, on word, behalf of all the entrepreneurs that we've ever worked with over the years, to Dr. Clark's point, I think a small business administration would be really helpful. Yeah. I have no issue whatsoever with tourism being part of the paradigm. My biggest issue is that the Hamians rarely participate mm. beyond middle management. Mm. And that's yeah. what needs to change. Okay. And you've got the Hamian expats around the world with means that are willing to see that sort of change. Mm -hmm. But we have to start where it doesn't take an entrepreneur two years to get a loan for a coconut factory at the AIC. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to go out and buy a suit to go to Bahamas Development Bank to be taken seriously. Right. Because they're talking about something outside of the banking or tourism sector, as it were. So I think that making dollars available for entrepreneurs of all skill sets is not only going to buttress the digital economy, but it's really going to jumpstart tourism because on Harbor Island, we have four Bahamian-owned resorts. I kind of took it for granted growing up. We, you know, heads and beds in the out islands is a very different concept. You know, it's more of a service economy in Nassau and Freeport, and I think the attitudes reflect it, and it's yeah. too bad because we are not made to just be a service economy. I mean, I went to training college. It was a fantastic experience. We all had to do the hotel tourism, you know, familiarization course. But that's a start to your career. It can't be the be and end all. Thank you very much. Wrapping up, finally, one word. So one word, we're wrapping up. One word as we aim to create a competitive advantage. What is the watch word for the next year? One word from each of you. In com- Yeah, one word as we go towards creating a competitive advantage in the next year. Diplomacy. Diplomacy. We come back to you? Yeah, excuse me, I come back. (laughs) (laughs) See, Alan. Imagination. Imagination. Passion. Passion. Possibilities. Possibilities. Strategies. Strategy. Uh, Foster. 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 Yeah. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. I didn't mean to push you into it. I would have waited. (laughs)
and I appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to facilitate this session. I now turn the mic over to Madam President, Senator Kay Smith.